Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being good to us. We want to thank you for providing our needs, and we thank you for your uh, guidance and for protection and for your blessings. We are amazed at how good you are to us and how you continually um, surprise us with your amazing grace and the joy and peace that you give to our hearts. Lord, we confess our sins to you this morning. Um, we are a broken race. The human race is broken and uh, infected with the virus called sin, the worst virus that has ever occurred in history. But we thank you, Jesus, that um, your, your forgiveness, your grace, is the vaccine for sin and we praise you Jesus we confess all of our sins to you openly and honestly and we ask by your grace and by your merits not by ours we can't bring you any good thing on our own but it is by your mercy that you forgive us and we plead for that mercy so we confess our sins Lord and we thank you for for your pardon we thank you for many reasons as we uh, just expressed this morning, Lord. We thank you for our families. We thank you for babies being born. Um, we thank you for a good day. We thank you for jobs. Um, we thank you for um, uh, family and friends um, that we have not forgotten, like Wanda had expressed just a moment ago. And um, we thank you for so many reasons. We thank you for our children. And we thank you for our homes. We thank you for life itself, which you said, Lord, is much more than just clothing and housing and things and material possessions. Life itself is precious. So we thank you for life itself. Um, Lord, we praise you for um, our church family. And we praise you um, for good health, and um, just so many reasons. I, getting these texts, Lord, I, I want to move into our request that we want to bring before you. And Lord, remind me, I hope I don't forget some of these names, but Lord, I want to pray that you will continue to be with little Jasmine. It breaks our heart. She's only 12 months old, and she needs your help, Lord Jesus. The parents, I am sure, are praying up a storm to you. Hear our prayers for Jasmine, Lord Jesus. Please heal her. We also pray for Juliet's dad that you will heal him, continue to help him to get better from this prostate cancer. We want to pray for um, Ishmael and Cynthia and Wanda and Juliet and her dad and, and, um, and Joe and uh, Lydia and... Uh, and the new baby, um, little Princeton, that was born to Sam and Jessica, we pray that he will continue to grow strong and healthy and help them to be good parents. Um, Lord, we lift up to you uh, Daniel and Hermosillo and, um, and uh, that you will be with him and the other person, uh, what was the other individual's name? Octavio uh, uh, and Octavio. We pray that you will be with them, Lord. Um, be with Danny, my own nephew, um, be with my personal family, and Christina and James, um, and uh, other names. Um, Lord, we pray that you will bless all of these prayer requests. And Lord, bless my own son, our own son, that you will protect him as a frontline worker, as an essential worker, and my wife as well, Lord, that you will be with them as they put on their personal protective equipment, keep them safe. And Lord, we present all of these requests to you. Lord, you are powerful. There's no problem that is too difficult for you. You have a thousand ways to solve our problems of which we know nothing. Amen. So we bring these to you, Father, yes. in faith Amen. and ask that your divine will be done in each case in those that uh, I did not mention. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Okay. Well, this morning, this morning, um, I want to talk about the resurrection. 
uh, the, uh, the Jewish uh, peoples still celebrate Passover year to year on the 15th of the, the Hebrew calendar, Nisan, which corresponds to our time. Uh, Passover began on Wednesday, this, just this past Wednesday, lasts for eight days. It will end this coming Thursday. And in fact, in our church, what we have done now, we don't uh, observe uh, the feasts in the sense that they are still required because we believe that Jesus fulfilled those types and shadows of those feasts. He fulfilled them in his life. And, but we have celebrated in order to appreciate the Jewishness of the Passover meal and the upper room with him and his disciples and even going farther back in Moses' day. Um, we have celebrated a Passover Seder in our church, and it's just wonderful. It's been a wonderful experience. We've Christianized it, and, and, and uh, the script, we had put Jesus as our Messiah because we believe that with all of our hearts. And uh, it's, it's just an interesting, uh, fascinating uh, picture into the Jewish background of the Passover. I enjoyed it. In fact, we were supposed to have it yesterday. We were supposed to celebrate a Seder last night. I was planning this, but of course, um, you know, this, uh, this pandemic had prevented us from doing that. But we are believers in the resurrection, and there's good reasons to. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start there. Actually, we're going to start in John uh, chapter 20. That's actually where I want to start. So open your Bibles to John chapter 20, if you have them there uh, at home. John chapter 20. So this is what I'm going to do for this morning. I want to talk about, um, I'm not going to do a comprehensive uh, study on all of the texts that talk about resurrection. Obviously for a sermon you always have to be selective, very selective. I want to talk about just a few passages of uh, the resurrection morning and then what Paul says to the Corinthian believers about the importance of the, uh, of the resurrection for our lives today. So I want to talk about that. And then I also, um, not going into minute detail, share with you some of those theories that the resurrection did not happen and some of the count uh, counter arguments against that. That's what I'm going to share with you this morning. So I hope you have your Bibles open to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Actually, I'm going to refer to two chapters, John chapter 20 and chapter 21. Now, this is a story where uh, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb um, and where Peter and John run to the tomb and where Mary Magdalene see, uh, sees Jesus and mistakes him for the local gardener and how Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room. Those two chapters, chapters 20 and 21 of John, mention these things, and it's interesting that all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all mention the resurrection. They all talk about the crucifixion, and they all talk about the resurrection. They may differ in some details, um, as, is such, as is usually the case when you have more than one person talking about the same event, you'll usually get their independent take on things and their particular angle on things because of what each person appreciates more or what each person remembers more. So don't let some of those differences uh, throw you off track of the uh, veracity of these, of these accounts of the resurrection. But all four Gospels talk about the death, they talk about the Passion Week, they talk about the death of Jesus, and they talk about the resurrection and, uh, and, of course, Jesus' appearance. One gospel won't even mention the appearance of Jesus talking to a couple of disciples that are on their way to a town called Emmaus. Um, those th three gospels don't even mention that. Um, however, John mentions this. And so there, you can bring all of these uh, uh, eyewitness accounts together and appreciate the different facets that they include in their own versions of the story, not contradictory, but complementary, and you get a holistic picture of what had happened. So John chapter 20, <clears throat> um, in verse 1, it says, At the first, or now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Verse 2, 
So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So she's thinking that somebody just uh, played a trick and took the body out. She had no idea what was happening. Actually, the disciples, not only her, but the disciples um, couldn't believe it. Now, that is key for what I'm going to say later on in, I don't know, in, in some minutes. That is key. Tuck that in the back of your mind, how they did not believe that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. That is a key concept to remember um, as far as answering some of these theories that are floating out there that Jesus never did really resurrect from the dead. So just, just keep that tucked in the back of your mind. So the rest of the scriptures in that chapter 20 say that Peter and John, it says the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is a reference to John, they came. They, they heard Mary telling them about the body's gone. They come and they are running to the tomb. Now John, being the, traditionally the youngest disciple, gets there first. Peter goes there second. But Peter's the first one to go inside. Typical Peter. He's always the first one to open his mouth and to do something. <laughs> Peter goes inside the tomb first, and there's nothing in there except for the linens that, were, uh, that wrapped Jesus' body nice and, and folded. And then John comes in later. Um, that's the account. And then later, Mary goes back. She goes back, and if you look at verse um, 13... Uh, 12 and 13 and forward, Mary encounters some angels. And she is wondering, where is Jesus' body? And verse 14 said, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. When there is something that you just do not believe because it just doesn't take place. And plus she's crying and she's just distraught. So she's in a mental state where she is just very, very distraught. She loved the Lord Jesus with all of her heart and now he's gone. Did somebody steal him? Uh, you know, the, 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 the big stone was rolled away, but what had happened? Did wild animals grab him? She didn't know. And Jesus was there and she thought he was the gardener. And I love this verse where it says in uh, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. <clears throat> Mary Magdalene, this is verse 18 of chapter 20. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. So when it was evening on that day, we're talking about Sunday night. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. That's the second thing I want you to tuck in the back of your mind in response to these theories that Christ uh, did not resurrect from the dead. Keep that in mind. They were up in the upper room for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now this is an interesting verse in verse 19. Um, it was Sunday night and uh, Peter and John had already gone to the tomb. They already seen the empty tomb. They come back. Uh, the disciples are there for fear of the Jews. And uh, so this is interesting. Apparently, they were still perplexed. Some hours had gone by, and they're still scratching their heads. Well, where is Jesus? It was just difficult for them to realize that Jesus um, had resurrected from the dead. And one of the other Gospels, the Bible says that the women, and again, you will get some uh, uh, um, different details, additional details in some Gospels more than the others. In the other Gospels, it says that the women went to go tell the men that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and they thought that they were just crazy, that they were out of their minds. They did not believe, nobody believed, that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, if you go back to Luke, let's go to the book of Luke, and let's go to chapter uh, 23, 
And at the very end of a chapter, in Luke chapter 23, that's the book just before John. So you have to turn the pages to your left, or go to your left. Luke chapter 23, and look at verse 53, Luke 23, 53. The Bible says, And he took it down, um, this is uh, Joseph and uh, Nicodemus, both, uh, Joseph asked for the body of Jesus after Jesus was crucified on that Friday afternoon. They're taking the body of Jesus down. And uh, verse 52 says that Joseph went to Pilate, the governor, and asked for it. And he took it down, verse 53, and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever laid. So this is a brand new tomb. Okay? Joseph knew about this tomb. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. So this is why we know that the, that the death of Jesus happened around 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday because it was about to be sundown on Friday, which meant the Sabbath was about to begin. Verse 55, Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. They saw the tomb. Joseph knew of this tomb. The women knew of this tomb. And they actually witnessed the body being laid in there. Verse 56, Then they returned the women and prepared spices and perfumes. When you embalm a body in those days, there was lots of spices and perfumes and ointments that were necessary, as it was customary in those days, to embalm a body and then wrap it up uh, for entombment. <clears throat> Verse 56, they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. And then verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 24 and verse 1, but on the first day of the week, it starts with that word, but on the first day of the week, in other words, after the Sabbath is over, which the Sabbath follows that Friday, on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. You see, this is a detail that we didn't find in John. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered into the tomb, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Verse 4, while they were perplexed about this, and then the rest of the, those verses say that angels appeared uh, to these women. So again, here's another account in Luke's, from Luke's vantage point, uh, Luke's uh, uh, writing that uh, they were perplexed about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, they were perplexed about the absence of the body. It was, it's more accurate to say they were perplexed about that. And what's interesting in these passages, in Luke chapter 23 and 24, is that we get a clear picture of the sequence of the days of that um, of death, slash resurrection weekend. It was the Passover feast. Jesus was celebrating. It happened to be, <clears throat> in our modern equivalent, uh, Thursday. It happened to be that that particular year, uh, when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples, that particular year, the Passover happened to be on the Thursday. That's when Jesus was celebrating in the upper room with his disciples. And then the evening came, they went to Gethsemane, uh, Jesus, the, the mob came out, Jesus was arrested, which you're not supposed to have a trial in the evening, that was not according to Jewish uh, jurisprudence, and Jesus didn't sleep all that night, one, two, three, four, five in the morning, didn't sleep all that night. Um, and he was tried in, on Friday morning, and he was finally, uh, excuse me, crucified Friday around 3 o'clock p.m., now, the Sabbath was approaching, which was Friday sundown. The Sabbath happened. Pilate took the body. They put Jesus in the tomb. The women were hoping to prepare all of their spices and perfumes uh, to embalm body, uh, Jesus' body uh, in, in a complete fashion. They ran out of time. And that's why in Luke chapter 23 and verse 56, it says they went back home to keep the commandment, which was the Sabbath commandment. Early Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, the first day of the week, they went back to the tomb to finish the work that they had started. Not 
understanding, not believing that, hey, maybe he is going to resurrect. That was the farthest thing from their minds. So the sequence of the days is that you have the day of preparation, preparing for the Sabbath on Friday. Then you have the Sabbath when Jesus is in the tomb, and then you have the first day of the week when he was resurrected. This is important, and the reason why I may sound redundant and technical and emphasizing this so much is because some people have asked me, well, when is the Sabbath? When is the Bible Sabbath? Well, it happens to be the day that Jesus was resting in the tomb. Now, when did Jesus rest in the tomb? It was between the day he was crucified and between the day he resurrected. In between those two days is when he was resting in the tomb, which means in our modern equivalent, the seventh day precedes the first day of the week when he resurrected. And the reason why I say this is because some modern calendars will start the week with Monday and end with Sunday. And some people will say, well, then Sunday is the Sabbath day, the day of rest. Well, then how do you coincide that with the sequence of these three days in Luke chapters 23 and 24? It just does not match. So um, that may sound like a technicality, but it is important to realize the first day of the week is the resurrection. The seventh day of the week is the last day of the week, which precedes the first day. And that is the Sabbath day that Jesus rested because the women kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I mentioned that I'm going to mention uh, what Paul says about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, this gets a little bit more personal now, what Paul is writing about to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that's just a couple of books to your right. If you're not that familiar with the Bible, um, I'm just saving you time so you don't have to go to the uh, table of contents. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Um, the Bible says this in verse 12. In verse 12. By the way, I, wanna, I need to mention this about Corinth. This letter of Paul, he wrote, well, actually he wrote four letters to the Corinthians. We don't have two of them. But this, what we call the first one, 1 Corinthians, was written about 55 AD. Now think about this. Christ was crucified roughly around 31 AD. He was baptized in 27 AD. Three and a half years later, he was uh, crucified. So let's say 31 AD. So from 31 AD, from the crucifixion of Jesus, to the time that Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, around 55, you have what? 23 years, 24, you have some 20 plus odd years. That's nothing. Um, th that is a small period of time. And I say that because of what Paul writes to the Corinthians just some 20 plus years after the death, uh, or after the resurrection of Jesus. So we'll get to that in a moment. Let's read. Verse 12. If Christ, oh, excuse me, I needed to go. So this is the point I want to make. Let's go to verse 3. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Some scholars uh, say that those two verses, verses 3 and 4, are one of the earliest apostolic fundamental teachings of the church, according to the scriptures, that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 5, and that he appeared to Kephas, then to the twelve. So Jesus is appearing to all of the disciples. Verse 6, verse 6 is important. After that, he appeared to more than how many? 500. I heard your voice through the camera lens. I just heard it. <laughs> and that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. At one time. It wasn't I appeared to 12, and then I appeared to 20, uh, you know, a week and a half later. And then I appeared to, you know, four, you know, some days. No, 
the Bible says that he appeared to 500 at one time, and this is what Paul says, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, which is an idiom for death. Sleep is death. So what Paul is telling the Corinthian believers, Corinth is just a stone's throw away from Athens, Greece, by the way. So Athens and Greece are all of that same area, Ikea area, where, there's, where philosophy and wisdom is highly prized. And Greece and the Greeks did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And so you have in a region of the world there where a bodily resurrection, a literal bodily resurrection is just unheard of. Now, I mean, I'm jumping ahead of myself. The Jews did believe in a resurrection. However, they believed that a resurrection would take place in the quote-unquote last day, way in the future, the day of the Lord. But they did not believe that a resurrection could take place now, but it was something that was reserved at the end of the world. They did believe that. That's what the Old Testament teaches, and that's what the New Testament uh, teaches as well. But Paul is saying, Christ appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. It says, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. That's a reference to uh, Jesus appearing, appearing to Paul on the road to Damascus uh, when he went to go persecute the Jews. So this is interesting. If I were to say... Um, I saw a pink elephant flying over Phoenix. I mean, I, I, I swear to you, if I were to say that, I swear to you, I saw a pink elephant, and it was, a, it was a larger than usual, and it was flying over the Valley of Phoenix. And 500 people saw this with me at the same time, and some of them, about 400 of them, are still alive today. Now, if you were to listen to that story, what would you do to corroborate my story? What would you do? Would you say, well, you're nuts. As an investigator, what, would you, what did you say? Go talk to the other people. You'd go talk to the other people. If I dare to say that 400 people saw this same thing as I did, um, at the same time, and 400 of them, then you'd talk to other people. And uh, so we're likely to believe a story when it is corroborated by more than, by many witnesses witnessing the same thing. But this is what Paul is daring to say to the Corinthian believers. All right, let's go where Paul is talking about the resurrection and how it really matters to um, our life today. Verse 12, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, which I am doing today. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? This is in Corinth. And this is why I said earlier about the popular belief in those days, what do you mean a resurrection? There is no such thing as a bodily resurrection. He says, if you're saying that, and how come you're saying that there's no resurrection from the dead? Now there's eight points that Paul brings out that I want to draw your attention to. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So apparently there was, they were sending mixed signals. Oh yeah, I believe Christ was raised from the dead, no doubt about it. According to the scriptures, Christ raised from the dead. But there really is no resurrection. There's not a resurrection but I do believe that Christ was raised from the dead. What Paul is saying is, well, if there really is no resurrection, then Christ hasn't resurrected. You can't have both at the same time. You can't be speaking out of both sides of your mouth. There's either resurrection or there's not. If there's not a resurrection, then Christ wasn't resurrected. I mean, just point blank, just simple as that. That's what Paul is saying. So number one, if there's no res resurrection, Christ has not been raised. Number one. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is what? Our preaching is vain, and your faith also is vain. And that's numbers two and three. Number two, our preaching is vain, and your faith is also in vain. 
So if you really don't believe that Christ, Christ was resurrected from the dead, then if you are saying things like that, in the back of your mind you have doubts, but if you're saying things like that, then you are just engaging in vanity. And your faith is in vain, is what Paul is saying. If you don't believe that Jesus literally, bodily, resurrected from the dead, if you don't believe that, then stop with your faith, is what I would say Paul is saying. Stop with your faith, because it's just in vain. And then verse 15, Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. This is the fourth point. False witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. If God says that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, but if you're saying that there is no resurrection and Christ has not been raised from the dead, well then who's right? Are you right or is God right? If you're right, you're making God out to be a liar. That's what Paul is saying. And then verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. So it's not only vain, it's worthless. That's the fifth point. You are still in your sins. That's number six, the sixth point. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, number seven. And then verse 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are, all, we are of all men most to be pitied. And that's number eight. So the first one, if there's no resurrection, Christ hasn't been raised. Your preaching about that is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. You're making your false witnesses of God. Your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Um, those who died have perished permanently because there is no resurrection. So death is death and that's the end of it, period. And then uh, number seven, if we only have hope in this life and not in a future life because of the resurrection. If we only hope, in fact, I changed the words today. Last week it was faith, and I put the word hope here. Well, we only have hope in this life, and there is no resurrection which would logically lead to a future sinless better world. But if we only have hope in this world, and that's it, then Paul says then we are to be pitied above everybody. And in fact, and if that were true, then why am I here speaking today in front of you? My preaching is in vain. My faith is in vain. So why am I here? If this life is the only life to live and there is no future life because of no resurrection, um, I'm not sure if I'll say just live it up, eat, drink, and be merry. Um, some people may do that. Just, well, I'm just going to engage in pleasure-seeking and hedonism, and that's going to be my life. Not everybody's going to think that way. Some people will say, oh, this is the only life. Well, I want to at least be good and be a benefit to humanity and, and do good in my life and make something of myself. I mean, you'll get different answers of that. But the Christian, because of the resurrection of Christ, guarantees our resurrection by faith, guarantees a future, better, sinless world where the Bible says only righteousness dwells, the resurrection of Christ guarantees all of what we are hoping for in the future. Not only having an abundant life now and living as good citizens um, and living moral lives now and being a benefit to, our, to mankind and to our fellow brothers and sisters, to other people, being compassionate and doing good in this world. We not only look for a future life and we don't care about what happens in this world. No, that's not what I'm saying. Our hope is in the future because of Christ's resurrection. But because that Christ was resurrected from the dead, and because we will have to give an account for all of our words and the deeds that we do in the body, we'll have to account to Christ in the future because we will be raised from the dead, because there's a future life, well, then we need to live the best that we can in the here and now. So you may have heard that, well, some Christians... All they talk about is the future world and, and the world coming to an end. And why don't you do some good now? Well, I would agree with that. We need to do some good now with the lives that Jesus has loaned us and these bodies that belong to him where you are purchased with the price. Therefore, honor the Lord God with your body. Everything that we eat and drink and everything that we say we do, we need to glorify God. So we do our best in the here and now while we hope for our future resurrection 
because Jesus himself has been resurrected from the dead. I want to mention some of these theories uh, at this moment, so let's switch gears for a bit. Um, there are about four theories that say that Christ did not resurrect from the dead. Now, these are old ones, so I'm starting with the old yesteryear ones that have just, they've been, I know you've heard them before, they've been debunked, um, they're, they're like an old shoe that has holes and it just doesn't work anymore. You just throw them away. You know, something that is worn out and, and just has no validity to, validity to it whatsoever. So I'm not going to spend a long, a long time on these old ones, but one of them is the swoon, what's called the swoon theory. And that theory states that Jesus uh, never really did die. In fact, he, uh, because of the abuse that he suffered on, on that Friday afternoon, that Friday morning, according to the swoon theory, Jesus fainted. He didn't actually die, but he fainted. And the coolness of the tomb, uh, when it was locked up and sealed by the Roman guards, the coolness of the tomb revived him. And then, lo and behold, um, early Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. Well, that is a ridiculous theory. Number one, Romans do not make mistakes in crucifying people on the cross. <laughs> they don't make mistakes. Um, because it could mean their own lives, which is why when the Roman came, remember they wanted to, uh, uh, the Roman with the, the iron club was breaking everybody's legs. Um, that speeded up, that sped up the death because people uh, by crucifixion usually died by asphyxiation. You can't breathe when you're like this forever. And of course, blood loss and birds picking at your wounds and things like this. Um, you crucifixion is a slow, painful, and horrible death. In order to speed up death, that's when the Bible says the Roman came and started breaking their legs because they would use their legs to lift up a little bit to breathe as much as possible to slow down, to not uh, suffocate to death. When they came to Jesus, they had already found that he was dead. But to ascertain and to confirm that he was dead, a Roman took a spear and whack and stuck him in the side and blood and water spilled out. And then, of course, they wrapped the body in, uh, in cloths and embalmed him, etc. And if he were to faint and he comes out of the tomb, well, according to the eyewitnesses, Jesus had no... Um, if he had revived, all of those wounds that he had suffered the whippings, the lashes, the flogging, uh, the beatings, the crown of thorns, and uh, the blood loss that he had suffered, etc. Um, if he would come out of the tomb and he only fainted and revived, uh, that was not the type of Savior that the disciples would have celebrated as resurrected from the dead. He probably would have come out all, you know, all really messed up because he still had those wounds and he still would have suffered. That's not the way he came out of the tomb. And again, of course, because the Roman guards, they just don't make mistakes. Um, the second one is that it was the wrong tomb, that everybody went to the wrong tomb. That's why it was empty. Well, that theory has been debunked many times over, and which is why we read earlier, they all saw the body of Jesus being laid in a particular tomb. It was a new tomb, and they all went to the same tomb. Well, how could everybody go to the wrong tomb? So that theory has been debunked. The third one was a conspiracy theory that the body was stolen um, by the disciples. The problem with that is the disciples until today, 2020, until today, people die and are martyred for Jesus. Um, it's difficult to believe that millions and billions of people throughout the history since the first century would die for a lie. The second one, again, is um, that there are Roman guards posted. Would the disciples be in a condition to fight off Roman guards armed that were there at the tomb making sure that nothing would happen? Because the disciples, and this is where those verses that I had said earlier this morning are key texts. Where were the disciples on Sunday morning? Where were they? They were in the upper room in hiding, and the Bible says, for fear of the Jews. That's not the way disciples act if, you, if you're going to go and steal the body and pretend that he was resurrected. They were hiding out 
for fear of the Jews. They were not about to beat up the Roman guards. And of course, the other one is that the guards themselves witnessed to the religious leaders. They told the religious leaders who had um, recommended to Pilate, would you set some guards please, because the disciples might come and steal the body. The Roman guards went back and actually, unbelievers, they did not believe in Christ, these are unbelievers, they go back and report to the religious leaders what actually happened, that Jesus in fact resurrected from the dead, and of course the Bible says that they fell as dead men when the angel came and rolled away the tomb. The last old one is that this was um, hysteria, that it was just mass hallucination. And this again, what I said, these texts are key in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says that more than 500 at one time saw the resurrected Jesus. Jesus appeared to the women. And this is another key that I didn't mention earlier. Usually, um, women witnesses were not counted as reliable. Um, that's just the way it was in, in, in that uh, uh, time and in that place, that women witnesses were not really counted as reliable, which is why we can now understand when the women went back to tell the disciples that we saw the resurrected Jesus, they thought that they were just nuts, um, that they were just fabricating this whole story. Um, that's the way it was. Interestingly enough, if you were wanting to write this account of the resurrection and convince people that the resurrection story is true. And so you're a gospel writer and you're writing these things in there. Why in the world would you write that it was women that saw Jesus first and then they went back and told the men? You wouldn't do that if you wanted to convince a community of the truthfulness of the resurrection. You wouldn't start with women. And yet the gospel writers are, are writing it as it happened. The problem with this hysteria or mass hallucination is that <clears throat> you go to a psychologist. Can 500 people at one time have the same psychotic hallucination at the same time, sharing that same, those same hallucinations? Um, as far as I'm aware, and again, this has been debunked, the answer is there's no way. Some of the newer theories now that are more uh, in vogue today. So those four theories are old ones. Some of the newer ones in vogue, and I'm watching my time here, um, is that it was a symbolic event only. <clears throat> and what that means is that the early Christians confused this symbolic event to be a real one. So when these reports are saying that Jesus was actually resurrected from the dead, well, that's just symbolic language. He didn't really resurrect from the dead. Um, it was, it's, it's just a symbol. But the early Christians, they actually believed it to be a historical event. Well, the problem with that is, I mean, would you, could a major religion and people dying for the faith and the, and the growth of the Christian church, could this happen on mere symbolism where if people, the new early Christians, are propagating this lie that Jesus actually did resurrect from the dead, and if it actually didn't happen, what would I do to disprove them? What would I do? I'd go to the tomb, roll away the stone, and produce the dead body of Jesus. <laughs> How can you say he resurrected from the dead in, his, in, his, in history? that it is an actual event where we can just produce the body. All the religious leaders have to do is go to Pilate, take, tell those guards to take the body out. We're gonna parade the body throughout the streets, unwrap the, the linens, and show everybody that this is Jesus. The Roman guard that stabbed Jesus, this is three days afterwards, only three days afterwards. Um, he can easily identify Jesus, and most people, everybody can identify this is the Jesus. He's dead. He didn't resurrect. Well, that's not what happened. Um, the other thing that I mentioned as far as symbolism is that no one believed in a present-day resurrection. So the first century Jews, the Christians, why would they say, if Jesus never really did resurrect, why would they say that Jesus really resurrected if that was not the popular belief in those days? Which is why I said earlier, the Greeks 
and in Corinth, is Paul's letter, they were heavily influenced. In fact, Jews in Jerusalem, in Palestine, um, Greek philosophy had been pre prevalent for a couple of centuries before Christ came on the scene. So the popular belief, not only in, in, in Greek philosophy, but even amongst the Jews in Jewish religion, according to the Old Testament, a literal bodily resurrection just does not happen. And in fact, there's verses to prove this. When Lazarus died, and Jesus finally goes to Bethany to go see Lazarus, it was his best friend, and Mary and Martha, uh, Lazarus' sisters. Jesus goes to Bethany, and Jesus tells both Mary and Martha uh, that your, your Lazarus will resurrect. And Mary says, Jesus, I know that on the last day he will be resurrected. She wasn't expecting for Jesus to be able to resurrect Lazarus on that day. They just weren't expecting that. The disciples we have already read were not expecting a literal bodily resurrection immediately. So in the Jewish um, religious, religious philosophy and their teachings, in fact, let me say this, the Sadducees didn't even believe in a resurrection at all. And in fact, when Paul was, uh, Paul was trying, this is in Acts, uh, the later chapters of Acts, when Paul was making his defense, he began to speak in Hebrew uh, when he was arrested in Jerusalem. This was way after his third missionary journey. Paul wanted to go back to Jerusalem. Um, his, his buddies and the Christians were telling him, no, don't go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you over there. But Paul was insistent, I'm going to. In fact, even a prophet uh, was uh, told Paul, uh, bound himself and Paul took off his belt and bound Paul up and says, this is what's going to happen in Jerusalem. Paul still went. And, uh, you know, it, it happened. Paul was arrested. Paul is talking in front of the people in Hebrew. And, um, and Paul says, you know why you are fighting against me? You know why people are against me? All I'm doing is preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said that on purpose because there was Pharisees present and there was Sadducees present. And Paul did that intentionally because he knew if I say that, the Pharisees and Sadducees are going to go at it with each other. Why? Because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did, but again, they believed in a post-resurrection on the last day. And of course, in that context, in Acts, that's what did it. The Pharisees started, well, what's wrong with this guy? He's okay. <laughs> we don't have any problem with him. And Paul was very smart in doing that. But anyways, they ended up taking him to Rome anyways. Um, the second new theory is that the resurrection of Christ is borrowed from pagan mythology. It's borrowed from pagan uh, mythology. And let me just uh, say a little bit about these pagan stories. Most of the myths um, in pagan mythology, most of them, not all, are symbols of the agricultural cycle of uh, death and resurrection. You know, the early, the, the rains, the drought, the dry season and the rains and the gods of fertility and the gods of the land and, you know, how the, the death of vegetation and the resurrection of vegetation, many of these myths are associated um, with the agricultural seasons. The other thing about these myth stories is that in these uh, pagan stories, there is no historical evidence that these myths were realized in real history, in real time and in real history. In other words, in flesh and bone. Um, you'll hear stories about Osiris in, in uh, Egypt and... and um, uh, and, and, and all of these e ancient Egyptian gods that died and r r uh, rose from the dead, etc., um, those were all myths, but there's no evidence that, these, that the people uh, uh, that wrote these myths and that these myths were actuated in real history. Um, I want to read a little bit of what this says here. Um, it says in my notes, skeptics like to parallel Jesus' resurrection with pagan deities, such as the Egyptian gods Osiris and Horus, as well as the Greek gods Attis and Odinus. But are these parallels accurate? Okay, so um, let me give you a few responses. Um, 
the pagans did not generally believe in a resurrection. That's one in, in, uh, in uh, the book called Come Let Us Reason. Uh, Saint Athanasius, I hope I'm reading that correctly, he lived in AD 296 to 373, so this is a long time ago. He points out in his work, and I misquoted the title of the book, he quotes out in his work on the Incarnation. Again, he lived in the 200s and 300s AD. In his book on the Incarnation, he writes, For all of the Greeks have told all manner of false tales, yet they were not able to feign a resurrection of their idols. For it never crossed their mind whether it be at all possible for the body again to exist after death. Again, they just didn't believe this. And uh, again, this is confirmed in Acts 17 when the Athenians mock Paul for his preaching about uh, Christ's resurrection. Remember in the Areopagus, Paul is preaching, they call it Mars Hill. And Paul is preaching, and he's preaching about the resurrection. And they start mocking Paul. What are you talking about, a resurrection from a bodily resurrection? That, that just doesn't take place. Um, here's another answer. The parallels between the story of the rising Jesus and the stories of, the, of these rising pagan deities. Um, um, allegedly, and here's one of the, the, one of the parallels, that the Egyptian god uh, Osiris had rose from the dead. Scholars are quick to point out that in Egyptian mythology, Osiris never really rose from the dead, at least in the, uh, or in the myth. He reigned as king of the underworld. As the Egyptologist Henry Frankfurt explains in his book, Kingship and the Gods, quote, Osiris was not a dying god at all, but a dead god. He never returned among the living. Um, so many scholars are pointing out that these, the fact that some believe that uh, the resurrection stories in the test, New Testament, they're just borrowing from myths. That is just not true. And then the last but not least one, and I'll end with this, is analogy. Um, I don't remember the names of the scholars. One of them starts with a T, a last name T, and then uh, Boltman, who is a, a, a Bible scholar, refuted uh, later on. But here's the last one, this new novel, um, and I don't say novel in the sense that it just came out the last couple of years, uh, but it's the newer one compared to those old theories that have been debunked. And that is this, that present reality dictates what happened in the past. And this is what I mean by analogous. So what I mean by this, if a resurrection does not happen today, then it is impossible that it can happen or that it happened in the past. What happens today in our reality dictates what must have been in the past. And that's this new theory. Well, if resurrection were to be common today, what would be the deal, big deal about Jesus' resurrection? This is one of the problems with that theory. If uh, we hear in the news that you know, such a person and such a person and such a person has resurrected from the dead. And I'm not talking about how a person stops breathing and then a couple of hours later or an hour later, um, you know, the, in the hospital bed, they end up, you know, reviving. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about death. When you're three days old, uh, when you're three days death old, I'm talking about death, death. If resurrections were happening all over the place, in every place of the world, then there's no big deal about the resurrection of Jesus. The fact of the matter is, when Jesus was resurrected, it was in a unique, amazing, unbelievable, um, shaking event that nobody believed that could happen, not even the disciples themselves. <coughs> and the other thing with this is, do what we observe today, does that dictate that everything in the past, in ancient times, it was the exact same way? In other words, is there an overemphasis that our observation today equals reality in the far past? And there are scholars and some uh, scientists that just have a real problem um, with that. In fact, even in science, I'm not a scientist, but even scientists I read fairly recently are, you know, the, the proverbial problem with light. Um, you know, light is still not 100% understood. And I just read not too long ago that now some scientists are, are researching and reevaluating their assumptions on the properties of light 
as far as the past is concerned and how light behaves from the past, let's say a billion light years ago, and in the present, what are some differences between those two periods of time in the past in the present. But these are the theories, some of the theories that have uh, been debunked in our um, that just do not match up with the scriptural accounts and evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me finish by saying this this morning. Going back to what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the promises that go along with that resurrection is his second coming. In fact, the Passover meal um, from the Christian, uh, the Christian celebration of the Passover. We call it communion service. When Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, he didn't just say, this is my body, after he prayed and, and you know, ripped the pieces of, of bread, um, which was more like a very, very thick tortilla in his day. When he prayed and broke the bread and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he shared the cup and he told all of them to drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, etc." cetera. Um, what Jesus said was not that you are just commemorating my death, which was, happened to just the next day. This was a Thursday that they celebrated the Passover. The next day Jesus was crucified. So he's not telling his disciples, you are going to commemorate my death. Um, I'm going to die, which they didn't believe. You're, you're going to commemorate my death, so I want you to do this from now on forever and ever and ever. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you proclaim my death. With these emblems of the bread and the juice, you proclaim my death, and this is what he said, until I return. He said, until I come back. So when Christians celebrate their communion services, it is not just a commemoration that Jesus died for our sins and his forgiveness is what justifies us in God's sight. We are proclaiming his death until he comes back. He cannot come back if he has not been resurrected. It's an impossibility. In that case, um, he's just a bunch of ashes nowadays. And my preaching and everything that I'm saying here is in vain. I might as well just go out and have some fun and go home and eat some cookies. <laughs> no. Along with the resurrection of Jesus Christ is his second coming. They go hand in hand. Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, his pure sinless life, although he became sin for us, Paul says to the Corinthians, his death on the cross, his resurrection three days later. Three days meaning you count any part of the day as a day. Uh, and that's just a footnote. He, uh, was uh, he was crucified on Friday. He rested on the Sabbath in the tomb. And he was resurrected on Sunday. Any part of the day in Jewish thinking was considered a full day. So if I were to say three days from now, I would say, I wouldn't include today, Saturday. I would say three days from now, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Three days from now is Tuesday. Not according to the Jewish reckoning. Jewish would say it would be Monday because you count Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So that's why if anybody is just there out curious in my footnote here, when it says he will resurrect three days later, any part of the day in Jewish thinking was counted as a full day. So Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, it is a whole package. It's a whole package. So if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have to consider other elements that need to come into play in our lives in preparation for the second coming of Christ. For if Christ resurrected from the dead, he guaranteed his disciples, I will come and return to you so that I can take you to be with me where I am. That's his guarantee. And he can only make that guarantee because he did rise from the dead. So I ask myself and I ask you about this resurrection. Am I living my life in a way that is God honoring? Am I being obedient to Jesus Christ and his law, not in order to be saved, 
but as an expression of my gratitude that I am saved? Am I living a life of faith today in my here and now, in my context, in order to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ? The resurrection means everything if Jesus did not rise from the dead. What that means is that our arch enemy, whom we call Satan, Lucifer, who rebelled in heaven eons ago, that means that death and sin and the devil are much more powerful than God himself. And that means that death is more powerful than life. While the Bible presents the reverse as true, God is the sovereign of the universe. Life, eternal life, is more powerful than death. And Paul said this, one day, because of the resurrection of Christ, Jesus will come back to this earth and we will be transformed in the resurrection in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection. And we will be able to say someday, not now, in a literal physical sense, but someday we'll be able to say, we'll say where, O oh death, is your sting? Amen. Where's your victory? Look, I'm alive again. Jesus' literal bodily resurrection, I didn't emphasize that in my sermon, but his literal bodily resurrection, although it's a glorified body, guarantees our literal bodily glorified resurrection and I pray that we will all partake in that resurrection if Christ doesn't come before we die. Amen. Death is temporary if you have faith in Christ. Death is temporary. It is not final. That's why the Bible calls it a sleep. It's a sleep. And someday we will wake up. When you go to sleep and it's a deep sleep, you don't wake up at night. Dogs barking or anything. It is a deep deep sleep, and you wake up, wow, that felt really good. You feel refreshed, and time goes by just like that. People who have been in comas and wake up, they don't realize that they've been in a coma for a year or a few weeks or a few months. They don't realize they've been in a coma. Well, what happened? Last thing I remember, I was in this place. Well, you've been in a coma for six months. What? It's the same thing with death. Those of our loved ones who have died, and they resurrect from the dead, it's as if it was just five minutes ago that they had died from whatever cause. That's how death is. It's a sleep. And by faith in Christ, you and I will be resurrected because Jesus resurrected and he's coming back. Amen. Amen. Why don't we uh, have a word of prayer and then we'll say goodbye. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for being our resurrection, the guarantee that by faith in you, that we will also share in your resurrection from the dead. Lord, it would be nice for you to return to earth and not having for us to die. But Lord, that's really besides the point. We know that it doesn't matter. And I speak to you personally, Lord, even if I die tomorrow, it doesn't matter because my faith in you, Jesus, guarantees that I will hear your voice when you come back to wake the dead. I thank you so much, Lord, and I pray that all of us within my hearing will have that kind of faith in your resurrection. Help us to not doubt. There will be some fancy-sounding, complicated-sounding arguments to refute Jesus' resurrection. But Lord, as time has shown, time and time again, all of those things are debunked. There's no real foundation to these arguments. It happened. It happened in history. It was a real event. And so, Lord, we thank you that you can hear this prayer. We pray together as friends and family that you will come soon. And if we die before, help us to die with that hope in the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are local here in Tempe, remember in about five minutes from 1230 to 1, um, you can just drive by and drop off your tithes and offerings. For all of you, God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath day today, and we'll see you next week. Don't forget, tomorrow morning, 
if you can, uh, am I still on? Tomorrow morning, um, if, uh, I'm inviting you to join me via Zoom at 6 in the morning, at 6 in the morning. Um, I'm just going to click on my Zoom and you can join me on that on the screen or go to our website, tempeadventist.com and look for on the home page where it says Zooming on Tuesdays and Fridays and just click on that link and you'll join us tomorrow morning to celebrate the resurrection. God bless you and have a blessed day.